We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Tonight, we've got a question from our latest Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron, Donna. Donna writes, Thanks for the great podcast. I found you through a link to your top 10 of 1000 video and have been working my way through the back catalog since. My question is about ultralight games. So quick and easy to learn that you can bring them to grandma's house for a good time with multiple generations. Uno-like, perhaps. My favorite of these types of games is Over and Out. Dead easy and quick, so much fun in a group, everybody always wants to play multiple times. What tiny step up would be Quicks, which plays so well no matter the size of the group, from two to a bunch. For the type of game I'm thinking of, the mechanic has to be minimal and easily grasped, preferably with instructions always right in front of you on the card or sheet. What ultralight games would you recommend for groups of mixed generations, kids all the way to seniors? Well, to start to say, I'm impressed by anyone who's going through our back catalog. Uh, Anyone else who just discovered us decides to do this, uh, this you brave fools, I suggest working backwards, right? Don't start at episode one, just so you don't get scared away by some of our earlier attempts at podcasting and audio issues and formatting issues. Next, thank you, Donna, both for the question and for supporting the show. Patrons like you help us keep doing this week after week. Thank you. Thanks. And I agree, old audio rarely holds up as well as other formats, but the content is still valuable, I hope. Now, getting to the topic on hand. I feel I need to start by pointing out that this is not my area of expertise, at least not what I consider my area of expertise. In general, I prefer medium to heavy, mostly Euro-style games. While I do enjoy lighter games from time to time and do tend to carry with me a number of filler games to any gaming event, I do usually shy away from the lightest of games. As a result of being part of this podcast, I must say my kids and I (laughs) are probably more towards the medium weight as well for the most part, though they do play some lighter fare with bombs. Now, that's not to mean that we're passing judgment on lighter games. There's no place for lighter games. There is definitely a place for them. Ultralight games just aren't the kinds of games that usually appeal to me or the gamers I usually game with. Now, this is a great example of how not every game is for everyone and how awesome that is. Now, I do have a surprisingly high number of later games once I started digging, but we do have still have plenty to talk about. Now, where I think ultralight games are awesome is exactly where Donna, what Donna mentioned in her question, for getting people together of all different types of experience, levels, ages, and diverse groups of people together at a table playing games and having fun together. These are also great for any type of gathering or event where the goal is to socialize. You're not there to play games, you're there to have fun and chat and socialize and be with other people, and the games are just there to facilitate that interaction and not the focus of the event. That's often the case with a really light game that you don't need to focus on it and that it's perfect for those group gatherings as a result, where people want to talk, eat, and socialize Mm -hmm. and not get locked down into four hours of 4X gaming to ignore everyone else around them. Yes. So before we dive into games, I think we first need to sit down and define what we mean by ultralight games, at least for our list tonight. This isn't going to be a big debate like we had about train games or anything trying to define ultralight games. This is just to classify the games we're looking at tonight to kind of reduce the flood of different games here. Now, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Like, I I honestly, I don't even think Board Game Geek has an ultralight category for us to look up. Now, what we could do, Board Game Geek does have, is a weight scale. And it looks like a limit for lightweight or ultralight might be 1.5. At first, I was going to say one, but I got to say, it seems like people rate even games that are considered dead simple closer to a two, where ones on their own seem to be saved for things like tic-tac-toe, win-lose banana, like games that are barely games. Lightness or weight in general is a really relative scale. So while Talisman may be heavy compared to tic-tac-toe, it's Mm -hmm. laughably light compared to, say, Starfleet Battle. Yes, and there's the whole fact that we are looking at Board Game Geek, which is generally a a super user site, right? It's a it's a place where gamers who are already into games go to talk about games. So their idea of what is light and heavy will have a lot of bias towards. Oh, of course, Race of the Galaxy. That's a simple game because I play um I, whatever a t- Twilight Imperium three times a night. That's all you do, and you never sleep. 
So what I think we have to do, instead of looking just like, oh, 1.5, that's it, is to go a little more abstract. Because to me, ultralight means a game I can teach in about five minutes, and that can be easily understood by someone who's never played a hobby board game before. Now, what I don't think matters actually is time. Like, I don't think there has to be a filler game, for example, a topic we covered a couple weeks back. I think it's the difficulty in learning that's much more important. For example, you can play charades for hours, but that doesn't make it a heavier game because you can play it all night long. One feature many people use, at least to help in terms of weight, is size of rules. Mm -hmm. If you're able to fit your game's rules on a single sheet of paper or even less, it's probably pretty light. Now, that was something that Donna actually mentioned in her question as well. So that definitely does classify it. And I will admit that is not something I took into consideration when I built my list that we're going to get to a bit. I didn't think to even compare the different rule book sizes. So, all right, I, we don't quite want to go with the with the, the board game geek thing. So one of the things we've done in the past, right, is we sat down and we, we have a whole show on game weight. You can listen to it if you want. So you know what we mean when we're saying weight tonight. Um, we decided Brace for the Galaxy was the median, the, the middle weight game, the perfect middle weight game. It's right in the middle of the scale. And last time we looked on Board Game Geek, and I didn't confirm today, sorry, is it was a 2.5 weight. So according to Board Game Geek scale, it was right in the middle. And we use Race for the Galaxy to determine if a game is light or heavy. I play this game. Is it easier to play and learn than Race for the Galaxy? Well, it's a lighter game. Is it harder to play and learn than, than Race for the Galaxy? Or does it make my brain burn more than Race for the Galaxy? Well, that's a heavier game. Now, for an ultralight game, I'm thinking the upper cap should be maybe Fox in the Forest or Codename. Those are the two games I'm thinking. Like, that just takes a, that step. To me, that's a light game. I'm not saying that those are huge, complex games, but ultralight would have to be simpler to them. What are you thinking for a baseline game to compare it to? Well, uh, with my with my gut and my noodling uh, with the BGG Advanced Search Engine, uh, I found roughly... Uh, a, a hard upper limit would be 1.5 weight on Board Game Geek. Okay. So that is going to knock Fox in the Forest out of the running. Uh, right. Fox in the Forest comes in at a 1.58. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Codenames comes in at 1.28. So it safely uh, safely comes in there, actually a little lower than the cat than the uh, the upper limit of the category, but a, a decent reference. See, I'm thinking Codenames itself isn't ultra light, just from personal experience. Because I have had that game fall completely flat and fail at a family gathering with my aunts and uncles due to them not getting the rules and not getting the concept. So, plus, the rule book is about 14 pages. It is not a one-page rule book. So taking that, if Codenames is 1.28, I'm thinking our upper limit should then be 1.25 on Board Game Geek. A small step below Codenames. So, so right. like Codenames is passed. So it has to be below code names on the weight scale to be considered for ultralight for tonight. Right. All right. So what I ended up doing for tonight's game recommendations is I went on board game geek. I filtered it by games I owned and games I rated. And then I sorted it by weight and went from there, starting at the lowest number and working up to 1.25. So unlike our usual list, when we do the, usually we do game that recommendation lists are in no order. These are. These are in order of weight, at least according to Board Game Geek, starting with the lightest game, growing more difficult, more complex, heavier as we get down the list. Now, all of these games are still ultra light. None of these games would be, cons be considered heavy in any way or even medium weight. So we're going to work up from the lightest to the heaviest. So the first game I have on the list is Personal Preference. This is a great icebreaker game where you place four cards out on the table into four different zones, and players then rank them in order of preference, one to four. Then everyone else bets on what they think the other players guess. Now, the game mechanics are dead simple, but the main part of this game is learning about the other players and the inevitable discussion that happens at the end of the round. Well, why'd you pick that? I can't believe that you put space flight over pizza. And Well, don't you remember when I was a kid, I grew up, I wanted to be an astronaut. Those kind of conversations are what makes personal preference great. And yes, that is a super mass market game that you used to be able to buy at Kmart. I have no idea if it's still in print. There's a caveat for this entire list. I did not check to see if these games are in print. I apologize. If it's our usual track record, about half of them you're not going to be able to get, and I apologize ahead of time. And also, for a game like this, you want to make sure you are aware of your family interactions. That kind of discussion at the end of the round might not be something your particular family does well with, but yes. 
we leave that up to you and your decision because that game was personal preference. Next, I have a sushi-themed dexterity game called Maki Stack. Now, this has a unique twist compared to other dexterity games I own and have played by being team-based. Each round, your team's going to work together to stack sushi pieces, nice wooden, Melissa and Doug, like chunky sushi pieces, to match what's shown on a face-up card. Now, the trick is, some rounds, one player is blindfolded and their partner has to direct them and in other rounds, players work together with each only being able to touch the pieces with one finger each. This is a great game for gamers of all ages, as long as they have steady hands. And that was Mackie Stack. Now, the games I've mentioned so far have been mostly kids' games, and a lot more games on this list will also be kids' games, or at least classified can be played with kids. Well, this next one is definitely not one of those. Uh, in Canada, this game is for ages 19 plus, and in the United States, 21 plus, and I think in Germany, 14 plus. This is unlabeled the blind beer tasting game. This is a game I actually kickstarted because it combines two of my favorite things, board games and craft beer, and it's a game Deanna and I like to break out on date nights or whenever having a, a beer tasting. Why not gamify it? This is the a beer and pretzels game night perfect game. Like, there's nothing better with a focus on the beer, of course. Each round, players get a sample of a beer, and they place a barrel on the board trying to identify the type of beer, the style, the alcohol value, and other features of that beer. The more accurate you are, the more points you get. I've got a detailed review of this one out there on YouTube and the blog if you're curious to know more, but we are big fans of Unlabeled. So a probably or possibly a great game for the aunts and uncles and grandma and grandpa, but not the one you want to bring out for the nieces and nephews. No, that was unlabeled the blind beer tasting game. So anyone who's listened to the show for over a year knows I had to include Go Cuckoo on this list. This is a very simple dexterity game that's kind of like the opposite of Kerplunk. It's, it's you're assembling things instead of taking them apart. Players are drawing wooden sticks from a tube and using them to build a nest on top of the tube with the goal of placing all of their eggs into the nest. Originally released as an Easter game by Haba, this has proven to be hugely popular with everyone I've shown it to. Players of all experiences, ages, and like everyone who has tried this game has loved it. And that was Go Cuckoo. Now, a couple years back, Yellow put out what was meant to be a series of games based on classic retro 8-bit video games. This is called the 8-bit box. That was the first thing you would buy is the 8-bit box set, and it was the core set for the system that included three games. Now, two of those games can be pretty involved. One particular game called Pixoid, I think, is a great ultralight game. This is a board game version of Pac-Man, with one player controlling the hero and the other players playing ghosts. Players try to stay alive for as many rounds as possible, getting some bonus points by collecting energy cubes. Once you played, once everyone's played Pac-Man, sorry, Pixoid once, then the game ends and you see who scored the most. So that is a really neat game, though it might be a bit expensive to get just for the one game, but it is, I got to say, at bargain prices, to be honest. Unfortunately, the 8-Bit Box concept didn't seem to have actually taken off. And that was 8-Bit Box, specifically Pixoid. Next, I have Super Cats, which is a quick-playing card game played over two rounds where players take on the role of Sentai Cats. If you don't know what I mean by Sentai, think Power Rangers. The Sentai Cats are trying to defeat the evil Robo Dog. This one is great for gamers of all ages and uses a simple mechanic of just holding up your hands, showing a number of fingers. I admit, when I saw this, I didn't expect much from this game, but we had a lot of fun with this, both with the kids and with the extended family. Yeah, this turned out to be a, a bit of a sleeper hit that we all sort of laughed at initially at the unboxing, but mm -hmm. turned out to have some uh, table presence. And that was Super Cats. Next, I have Breakdancing Meeple. In this game, you get a set of six meeple, which you roll like dice, trying to match the patterns on various dance move cards. At the end of each round, you get to dra draft new moves and improve your repertoire. Dead simple with an amusing theme that features a new use for a traditional game component of Meeple. This was a game when I played it the first time, I was like, how did someone not put this game out yet? Like, why did it take so long for someone to have done this? Yeah, I, I suspect that uh, a lot of people sort of had this on their to-do list 
and just never crossed it off. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the rolling pig game has existed for, you know, yeah, past centuries. The past the pigs has existed for centuries. And this is just a modernized meeple version of it, essentially. And that is breakdancing meeples. Next, I have the penguin flicking game Ice Cool. You are penguins in a high school attempting to sneak out of class and grab some fish to snack on. Each round, one of the players takes on the role of hall monitor and is trying to catch the other player. Now, the best part about this game is the penguins are weighted like Weeble Wobbles. People still know what Weeble Wobbles are, right? <laughs> I, I don't even know if those still exist, but they're weighted at the bottom. They're definitely, they're bottom heavy and they're rounded on the bottom. And due to this, you can do some really interesting things with how you flick them, including making them jump over walls. Ice School is one of those games that tends to get people interested as long as they're all good for flicking. And if you check on TikTok, I happen to know there's at least one person out there who has done some amazing trick <laughs> shots on uh, on Ice School. I'm... Yeah, I'm going to have to search for that one on TikTok. I've been slowly collecting board game people over there. Next, I have the show, a game that somehow became patron of the show's Tori's favorite game. He was obsessed with this game as soon as I showed it to him. That is Rhino Hero. This is a stacking game based dexterity game meant for kids, but that I have had a ton of fun with with gamers of all ages. It combines the feel of building a card house, like card houses out of playing cards, with take that elements, like forcing your opponent to build twice in a row, or having to find, pick up, and move the surprisingly heavy Rhino, Meep Rhino Hero Meeple that's going up your growing structure. And yes, I know there's also Rhino Hero Super Battle, and I still haven't had a chance to try that. So I'm sticking with just base Rhino Hero. And there's also an extra large version of the game. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> but that was Rhino Hero. Now, a different type of stacking game is Animal Upon Animal from Haba. Each player starts with a set of wooden animals, animal, that came out weird, wooden animals, and there's an uneven crocodile in the center of the table. Roll the dice to see which animal you have to place and stack it on the crocodile or the existing animals. If any fall, you collect them all. First player to get rid of all their animals wins. Uh, interestingly, this is a game my kids got sick of quick. Like, and I found other people who have it for their kids get sick of it quick, and the kids seem to get sick of it way earlier than the adults especially nights when there's adult beverages involved. I, I, I still, I've still never actually played Animal on Animal, and I don't think I could play it without cracking up as to the, the underlying adult message that could be seen from stacking Animal upon Animal. There is that. Now, the most horrific game on this list, something that, that people may debate isn't even a board game, but I'm sticking with it for now, is Loop and Louie. This game features a mechanical plane on a boom arm with a gimbal at the end. It's weighted that flies around the board in a clockwise fashion. Players each control a paddle that can flip Louie up into the air where he does various loop-to-loops -loops and comes down somewhat unpredictably, with the goal being to get Louie to crash into your opponent's chicken tokens. This is such a silly and simple game, but I have seen players of all ages play for hours and hours. I have seen this set up at a six hour game session and it was played the entire time. Now there is also a Star Wars re-theme of this called Loop and Chewy out there. I have heard the components aren't as good and it only plays three players. So I haven't actually picked that one up despite the obvious Star Wars love and Star Wars theme. And that was Loop and Louie. Next, the game all about making a psychic bond, medium. This party game is great at all player counts. It's great for a two-person date night or a duet night or a full party. Players each play a word card from their hand. Then they work together to guess the medium of those two words, a word that applies to both of the clue words. Now, if they both say their words simultaneously, and if they say the same word, they win and get some points. If they fail, they get to try again. But now they have to use the word they just said. You get a total of three tries before the game moves on to the next player, and you just play around until the deck of cards basically runs out. And that was medium. Next, I have Dr. Eureka, a science-themed game that has players taking three test tubes filled with three different colors of balls. 
A card is flipped, showing a pattern. Players then have to pour the balls from one tube to the other, attempting to be the first to match the pattern on the card. This is the whole, you have various waters and you're trying to, or the, the power toy that people had as a kid with three different pillars and trying to swap the order on them. It's a very traditional game done with some great physicality. First player to get their test tubes to look right wins the round, takes the card. First player to collect, I think it's three, but some set number of cards wins the game. Simple and fun and great for most ages. And that was Dr. Eureka. Now, my all-time favorite dexterity game is Hamster Roll. This features a rather large wooden wheel with a number of slats or spokes on it. Similar to Aminal Upon Animal, players start with a set of matching wooden shapes, and the winner is the one to put the last, we success, the last shape successfully on the wheel. The placement rules in Hamster Roll add a real solid level of tactics and even a bit of strategy to this dexterity game. And that is also my favorite dexterity game, Hamster Roll. Next is the mind. Take a deck of cards numbered one to 100, give each player one card, now play them in order. Sounds easy, right? The thing is, players are not allowed to communicate in any way. If you manage to beat the first round, move on to a hand of two cards, and so on. It gets harder and harder, but thankfully you have things like extra lives where you can screw up a round and throwing knives to get you out of a bind. Guess it's a game. <laughs> and that was the mind. Next, uh, while going through this list on Board Game Geek, I saw Pictionary, I saw Win, Loser, Draw, and I saw a number of different draw and guess games. Personally, I didn't put any of those on the list because of Telestration. This is Eat Poop, You Cat, or the telephone game with drawing. You get a clue, you draw that clue, then you pass your book to the left. That person looks at what you drew, flips the page, and writes down what they saw. Then they close the book and they pass it. Then the next person gets it. They have something written down. They try to draw it. You keep doing that until the book gets back to you. And you will be shocked by just how far away that final drawing or guess will be from your original clue. This is one of the most fun games I have honestly ever played in my life. Like Telestrations is a brilliant piece of design. Yes, I get that it's just modifying an, an existing common game that everyone supposedly played, but it just works so well. Though you probably want to toss out the scoring rules. They're kind of silly. Just play as many rounds until you're sick of it or someone's thrown up their McDonald's from laughing so hard. And that was Telestrations. McDonald's not included. Yes. Hey, there's more. The game. This is a pitched-based card game where players are given an item and a feature of that item and have to give a Ronco-style pitch about that combo. But then, halfway through their pitch, they say, but wait, there's more, and flip over a new feature, which they have to include in their pitch. This is by far the best pitching game I've played, completely destroying all other games of its type. Now, sadly, this one I do know is long out of print. Um, it's put out by the Bamboozle Brothers, Jay and Sen, and I've been begging them to bring it back. And every time I do, they go, hey, give us a publisher. We would love to bring it back. So publishers, pick up this game. It's amazing. We'll help advocate it. And that was, but wait, there's more. Next is Ratuki. This is a classic card game recently reprinted by the Op or USAopoly. Players play cards from their hands, trying to make stacks of cards that start at one, with each subsequent card going either up or down by one number. When you're able to play a five on a stack, you shout Ratuki and claim that stack. At the end of each round, you get points for the cards you gathered, but then lose points for any cards you didn't get played. And that was Ratuki. Next, I have Rumble in the Dungeon, a game I haven't broken out in way too long, and that's just because we haven't had public play events. You make a dungeon out of tiles, put one character in each room, and a treasure test in the furthest room from the door. Each turn, players either move a character, to a new room, or have two characters in the same room fight, picking which one gets defeated. You can also try to bring the treasure chest with you and try to escape with it. You get points for being one of the last characters standing, and you get extra points if you get the treasure chest out. Now, the trick that makes this game work is the fact that no one knows which characters are played by which players. That's all hidden information designed at the beginning of the game. This is one of the fastest and lightest games that I break out regularly. 
I break this out at home as an icebreaker at the beginning of an event, or we're waiting for things to wrap up. And it's also great for public play events and can play a huge player count. I think all the way up to 10. This, this is a great one. And this is, or this was Rumble in the Dungeon. Now, of course, I had to put Pitch Car on the list tonight, though I don't know if I, a Pitch Car doesn't feel ultra light to me, though I guess the, the basic mechanics of Flick a Car are definitely pretty simple. The crash mechanics a little harder. Um, actually, there's a surprising number of dexterity games on the list, so which was part of what made it so long. But board game geek users tend to think, hey, it's a dexterity game, it's a one. I don't know. I've talked about Pitch Car a million times. It's a racing game with a modular wooden track that features wooden crokinole like cars that you flick around trying to win the race. Uh, the great part about this game is somehow it just manages to keep everyone engaged. You want to see how well your opponents flick and if they make that jump. Even in, when it's not your turn, you're excited to see the outcome. And it's also a game that never manages to not get a crowd of people watching. And that was Pitch Car. Next, I have a push-your-luck bluffing game featuring coaster-like cards, which is Skull or Skull and Roses or Roses. The currently produced version is called Skull. Players arrange their stack of cards, which consist of a number of flowers and one skull in any order face down, so no one else can see it. Then players take turns bidding how many cards they can flip before revealing a skull. Well, I can flip four, I can flip five, I can flip six, well, I'll flip eight until the bidding's done. And then that person is going to flip that many cards, picking who to flip in whatever order they want. So, Sean, you flip yours, then D, then Mo. Mo, you flip two, then you flip one. If they get a skull, before they hit their, their bid amount, they bust, losing one of their tiles. When you're finally out of tiles, you're out of the game. Now, the first player to win two rounds of the game, two rounds, not necessarily in a row, wins the game. This is a great game for large groups, very simple, great drinking game as it uses coasters, though you probably don't want to use the one you purchased. But if you do have a coaster collection, as long as everyone has three identical coasters and one that sits out different, it, you can do it. Plus, you can literally play any number of players as long as you have enough coasters to play, which is one of the reasons you might want to pick up Skulls, Roses, and Skull and Roses just to have a bunch of different safe coasters. And that was Skull. Next, I have a very simple tile laying game about building monsters called Monster Factory. This is a fantastic gateway to other tile laying and matching games, specifically of the type where the sides of the tiles have to match, like Carcassonne or um, Isle of Sky. This is, I would say, easier to learn than dominoes because you don't actually have to count. My kids love the silly looking monsters you make with this game, but there's actually enough depth here to keep actual gamers involved, mostly based on the rules for creating minions and eye-based scoring. And trust me, that makes it sound way more complicated than it is. This game is I break it out for adults anytime we're around the Halloween season, but my kids play it regularly. And that was Monster Factory. Now, speaking of dominoes, that leads me to King Domino. This is a domino drafting game where each tile features up to two different terrain types. You are building your fantasy kingdom, trying to connect similar train types to each other, and trying to make sure to tie in some crown tiles, which are going to multiply your score the more you have. This one, like King Domino, shocked me for how much depth there was for such a simple-to-learn game. This was a game where I bought it at an Extra Life event, brought it to the table, read the rules, and was playing in five minutes, finished, sorry, I didn't buy it, sorry, finished my first game, I used a demo copy, then went, grabbed a copy, walked up to the counter, and bought a copy to bring home after my first play. King Domino is fantastic. And that was King Domino. Next, a truly classic mass market game that has been around for ages, Racco. This is one of those classics that's been around forever that I still love. One of the games I played when I was a kid. You start with a set of cards placed into a rack. The cards are numbered cards, and they're in random order. Each turn, you can replace one card in your rack with a newly drafted card, uh, either from the top of the deck or from the discard pile. So there is some strategy there, with the end goal of having all your cards in numerical order by the end of the game. First person to do that wins, and there is a scoring system as well. I have enjoyed this game since playing with my parents, like like six, seven, eight years old, maybe younger. Uh, this is one my grandmother used to love that I would bring over to play at her house when she was still around. Like th this, I think, really fits Donna's question. And it's still readily available. And that was Racco. 
Next, I have Zuro, the game of the pack. You start with a really cool little piece representing a dragon on the edge of the board. Each round, you're going to play a tile from your hand, and every tile has multiple paths on it, so that every path goes out a different exit, that different side of the, the tile, with the goal being to stay alive as long as possible. Don't connect to a path that sends you off the end of the board, and don't crash into other players' dragons while still trying to make your opponents do exactly that and end up off the board and crashing to each other. The last dragon standing wins. This is my go-to ultralight game to have at every gaming event just to keep people occupied while other games finish up or for waiting for things like food to show up. It's just one of those games I leave out on a table. Anyone who needs to play, I can teach them in probably under five minutes. Just walk up and like, you do this, do this, do this. Okay, I'm going to go back to my game. And that was Zero. Now, if you want games that draw a crowd and get everyone at the table laughing, check out Cash and Guns. This is a game about thieves gathered after a big heist, deciding how to split the loot. You are looking at a Steve Buscemi movie right here, basically, a, a, a Coen Brothers, the end of a Coen Brothers movie, or Reservoir Dogs. Um, now, this game does feature pointing foam guns at other players, so that's not going to be for everyone because of that. And depending on how you're raising your kids, you may or may not want them playing with toy guns. But if you're cool with the theme, this standoff game can be a ton of fun. This is a take that, laugh out loud, making deals and breaking them kind of fast and furious game from Steve Jackson Games. And that is Cash and Guns. All right, it was a long list tonight, I know. Finally, I want to finish with Ticket to Ride New York. To me, the simplified version of Ticket to Ride is, is the very edge, like, like the very edge of what I'd consider ultra late. Honestly, just because there's like it's not a one page rule book, there's enough little things with the routes to explain and and the way the, the thing wipes if you get too many engines, it's probably just a bit over the fence. But I wanted to include it because this is my top. This is it. This is this is this is probably my favorite light game. Just getting off starting the next category. This gives you all the feel of ticket to ride in a small box, easy to learn format that I find is really good for low player count. And that was. Ticket to Ride, New York. And supposedly London or Amsterdam should also fit this category. Those are the other city games that are supposed to be in the same thing. But I've only played New York. Now, I do have two honorable mentions tonight. Um, first off, I have to mention Oi, That's Me Leg. My Leg. I would say Me Leg, but the actual title is Oi, That's My Leg. Um, this is the lowest weight game I enjoy, based on Board Game Geek. When, when I sort by weight, it is rated a 1.0. And it was the first game that showed up on the list. I'm like, oh, I got to mention that. So, Oi, That's Me Leg, My Leg, sorry, is a game from Games Workshop. Yes, the, the Warhammer miniature people. It was part of a series of four kids' games that they put out in the 80s with the premise that this was supposed to be something you give your kids to do to keep them busy while you played Warhammer, which I thought was pretty amusing. Now, each game included a tape, like a put it in a tape deck music tape with trollish tunes on it. Uh, that we used to play while cruising downtown Windsor. Yeah, we were a little strange. It was that or anime soundtracks before people who knew what anime was. Uh, this is a rather fun roll and move game about collecting troll bits and an attempt to make two complete trolls. Take that elements and all the stuff you'd expect for a roll and move, like skip a turn and all that. I actually reviewed this one and talked about the other games in the series on the blog. So if you are curious about the troll games from Games Workshop, check out the blog for that. Uh, we actually played some of the trollish tunes uh, into one of the podcasts uh, early yeah. on in our uh, early on in our series, but that was Oi, that's my leg. Right, the other one that showed up on the list, I decided I wanted to include, but it's not really a game on its own. Is something called Start Player. This is a small box game published by Bezier Games that is meant to be a game you play before starting the main game. Playing Start Player replaces whatever silly Start Player rule exists in the game you're about to play. You draw a card from a deck that will have something on it like the first player to say the alphabet backwards or the first player to jump on one leg or the players with most buttons on their clothes goes first. In addition to that, every card has an arrow on it so that if there is a tie, you just look at where the arrow points. So it actually does, just in case it's like the tallest person, you're all the same height or whoever's wearing blue and no one's wearing blue, it actually accounts for that. It also includes a nice, chunky, big, white start player meeple with a start player t-shirt on it which is great if you play games that don't have their own start player token, which is something that I think every game should come with, as well as long as start player matters. 
some games it matters, some it doesn't. Plus, there's an added rule in start player that if you ha currently have the token, you can't be the start player in the next game. So I, I dig this. I loved it. I brought this to every game night. It was my most played game on Board Game Geek for a while. And then while Schwazi came out. And that's just so much quicker and simpler. Except uh, there is that whole pandemic issue. So touching other people's phones is occasionally. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, start, start <laughs> player, you probably still also have to take some cards out. Right. I, I remember one of them being something about putting something in your mouth. And I remember someone putting the start player in and, their mouth. And we'll just leave that there. That wraps up <laughs> our list of our favorite ultralight board games. Now, let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. All right, I got to say, there has been a ton of stuff flowing by, and I was trying to ignore it. So I, I was good, and I ignored the list. I, I admit, I, unfortunately, I, I have asked also and ignored the list. Uh, what I actually did... While we were while we were chatting, was I was massaging a board game geek search. Okay. Um, so I've gone into board game geek and done an advanced search, looking for things that uh, sort of match with what we've been talking about uh, when it comes to you know, ratings and 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 weights. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, board game geek tells me that the number one choice, of course, is love letter. Uh, followed <gasps> love letter is not ultra light to me. Yep. It's light, but it's not. It's complicated. You got eighteen different cards you have to learn, each but do their own thing. It requires reading comprehension. There's no way it's a one-page rule book. It's a one point one nine. Nah, uh, that's that's people hating on it and rating <laughs> it a one because they're like, oh, love letters are too light. That's all for people who only play Candy Crush. Uh, the next three, I think, are are kind of obvious. King Domino, which we had on our yep. list. Sushi Go, which you don't have, so you didn't have in your list. Yes, I was going to um, Sushi Go, I almost put on for your sake. Yeah. I, I had it there, but we already had 29 <laughs> games, so I decided not to put it on the list. Yeah, uh, Skull, which you again, you had on yep. your list. Uh, Dixit Odyssey is the highest rated Dixit on the game, on the list. All of the Dixits would yeah, have been on this list, depending on how I sorted it. Uh, but Dixit Odyssey is the one that actually has been, been, it, been out longest. I actually cut it off at 2010. So yeah. some, the original Dixit, I think, is 28, 2008. So. so Dixit Odyssey is somehow an update to Dixit, and I don't know what they changed. I loved Dixit when I first played it, and then I, I found it was too player dependent. And to be honest, I didn't put it on the list just because I'm like, eh, I, it, I, we got the 29 games. There was stuff I had to cut. Uh, the one that's actually highest on the list, if I sort by uh, geek rating, is just one from 2018. See, I, I want that. I want to try just one. Just <laughs> one would probably should have been an honorable mention. Right. Just one is a party game where one person knows the, like you're, you're, you got one person guessing yeah. and they'll say, you know, a chocolate bar. And then everyone else has to write down a clue to try to get them to say chocolate bar. The thing is, if two of us write the same thing, they get canceled out. So Sean wrote Nestle and I wrote Nestle. They, the, the clue hearer wouldn't hear Nestle, right? right. Like there's, there's a way that works. They're only allowed, each clue can only be in there once. That's the just one. And then of course, depending on how much gets eliminated, they have to try to guess where it sounds fantastic. I, I tried to figure out who was publishing and reach out to them. It didn't work. But yeah, that's one. I, I If the, the pandemic didn't happen, I probably would have picked that up by now. And uh, the other three uh, no, notable mentions here are Clask, which is the magnet uh, pushing the ball. Blank. Oh yeah. That, that was a Target exclusive, so I don't even know if you can get that in Canada. Oh, okay. Without, like, like, you can get it on Amazon, but it's not cheap. Right. Uh, Point Salad. I have heard really good things about that. Have not tried it myself. And one I'm surprised didn't fall on your list, Junk Art. No. I, that's, again, that one's not light because there, you have to relearn how to play every round. Right. There's so many different stacking games. Like, that's like a 20-page rule book with all the different <laughs> ways to play. So, no, I, I saw it. So, okay, going to the chat, we got we got May is asking if concept is ultra light. I would say no. Concept is not easy to get the concept across. It takes way more than five minutes to teach. Right. That, it's close. It, it, it's up there. But And once you get it, yes, like concept's a dead, simple, quick game. But they're, like new people, you need to play with a bunch of existing people and have the new people watch for a couple rounds. And then they'll get it. And as she games points out, concept is a 1.4. So there you go um yeah so deanna agreed fox in the forest should be light not ultra light uh ryan's asking breakdancing meeples over meeple circus but we don't think you've played meeple circus oh yeah i, pl I played meeple oh, okay. circus completely different game 
like like not even at all similar oh okay sorry there the uses an app and there's a time limit and there's meeple involved so i shouldn't say not at all similar so breakdancing meeple you have all the components in front of you and then you have cards where you were trying to set things up a certain way but there's no rolling of anything so like you'll get a card that shows two meeples holding up a, a, a balance board so you just have to take two meeples and set up a balance board and then there's another one that shows like a clown on his head with a ball. So if you manage to stack a meeple with the clown on its head with a ball, you're going to get the points. And then you get bonus points for how high you are. So you might have put the two meeple together with the panel, and then you might put the clown. Well, if you can put that on top of each other, you're going to get even more points. And it's real time. So there's music playing in the background, and you're trying to get the stuff built. And it's you're earning cards from matching patterns with the meeples, but there's no roll of them. It's, it's just it's a pure dexterity game with cute components. And, and really cute component. Like there's horses and elephants and all this stuff. And then later you can get money to buy new elements. But that part I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't own the game. Uh, there was a demo copy at one of the local game stores and I went to a demo night where someone taught me to play it. Uh, and Donna in the chat was mentioning, uh, recommending Towers of Hanoi and Amsterdam. I, why am I blanking on Amsterdam? Why do I, I know what that Towers of Hanoi I don't recognize off the top of my head. And Amsterdam, I am drawing a blank. Yes. So Deanna, Deanna notes, don't shout Robo Dog over and over when there is a dog in the room. We did learn that. Uh, Tech still hasn't gotten to play Go Cuckoo, which is just wrong. Yeah, Mo Me Meeple Surface is a neat game. It, I, there's no reason to buy it because Deanna wouldn't like it. And it, it just, I have other dexterity games. And yes, there are a lot of dexterity games. But again, I think that's because they're not really heavily complicated. I'm wondering if this is the 1973 Amsterdam, which is a uh, move through the waterways. Uh... People love the mind, telestrations, telerations, not fun with people who can actually draw. I, I, don't, I disagree because you're passing. One person being able to actually draw does not ruin a game of telestrations to me. We, we have played with people who can draw. I, I personally have not found that. Maybe if everyone can draw, but part of it is the time limit, right? If you use a timer, and make sure that people don't have a lot of time limit. You don't have enough time to draw well, or or you I, start I drawing. You myself. start drawing well, and you end up getting caught because you've gone into too much detail, and you've got you know gorgeous flowing hair, but you've missed all the details on the face that, that matter. There's a bunch, and of... then then someone guesses head and shoulders, yeah. because they <laughs> saw hair. Like I don't, I haven't seen that impact. I'm not, I'm not trying to discredit that you haven't seen that Moonha, but I just personally have not seen it. Anytime we play with people, who can, I can actually draw, but I can't draw in Telestrations. The other thing is you switch to the the, the non-mass market the version with the fatter markers, and that'll ruin anyone who can draw anyway. Well, and also the upside drawn variants uh, can completely destroy anyone's hope no. of drawing anything. I, I That was on the list. Like, it was in the Board Game Geek list for the right weight, and I skipped it. Um, so there, she's saying do it. Minimal art skills. To go to random. Sorry, I'm trying to go through quicker here. Merch is here. King Domino is the only of, thing Ryan's played. A lot of love for Racco. People really love Racco. Oh, Racco's good. Like, like for great mass market, I see it now. So addictive. That was our favorite game. If we ever go to a, a, a um, what do you call it? White Elephant? Uh, you know, a Secret Santa kind of thing where you'd like have to put in a $10 gift yeah. and people randomize. We tend to go and pick up a copy of Racco from, you know, Walmart or wherever. Yeah. No thanks, dead man's draw. So no thanks, no thanks. What what weight does board game geek give? No thanks. One point one four. One point one four. Wow. So why? How would I miss that one? That's weird. That should have been on my list. No thanks is a great one. No thanks is a fantastic game. You get past a card, you either put a chip on it and keep passing it, or you have to take it and you get all the chips. You're going to score your cards and add them all up. But if you have a chain, so if you have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you actually only score the lowest number. And that's it. Like, that's the basic rules. I basically just taught it. Once you see it playing, it makes more sense because it's the whole the chip thing is a big deal, right? Like, is it worth taking so I can pass more later or do I not do it? And then there's something to do with points for that. Um, Dead Man's Draw is fantastic. Way too complicated. Way, way too complicated. It's almost up to medium weight because you have to remember what 11 different suits do. Dice Heist have not played. Age of War, uh, again, too complicated. I would go for Roll for it to replace that or King of the Dice. 
And those were both games I own that I chose not to put on the list because I don't think they're as good as the 29 games we did mention. And can Golden Fun Employed, I have not tried. Uh, Dead Man's Draw does come in over our limit. It's a 1.35. Yeah. Oh, so that should be like a 1.6, in my opinion. Llama Dice, Scape, Goat, Spies, and Skull. Uh, okay, there's no commas here, so I have a hard time here. Llama Dice, I know is a game. Never played it. Space Cape Ghost. Ghost. Cape, Cape Goat. Goat. Wow, I haven't played any of these games. Spire's End, nope. Skull, yes. Coyote, no. Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale, nope. Martian well, Dice. Fairy Tale, is Fairy Tale? No, Fairy Tale is a drafting game. Martian Dice, nope. No, oh, wow. That is a list Europe. of games I have not played. Oh, wow. I'm impressed. That All doesn't right. happen often. I will copy that into the notes for you. Yeah, that's a good one. That's that's a good one to have. Martian Dice, they're okay. Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas is a little complicated. There's some things going on there that are a little harder to explain. I do like Las Vegas. Uh, six Nimit, I've never played the Nimit games. Uh, you know what? I played Six Nimit on uh, uh, Board Game Geek or Board Game Arena quite a bit. My only concern is it could end up a little aggressive for a family thing. So yes, I think it is an ultralight, but it may not be ideal for family for family. Uh, so Ryan agreed that Dick's it, maybe not. I think if it, it, it classified, I just didn't enjoy it enough. Yeah, that, that seems to be the thing. It, it, it hits all the marks, but it seems to be a real deci- divisive game, right? You either love it or you hate yeah. it. Yeah, Math Guy Dave saying the same thing. Dave's, Dick's is the least favorite of that type of game. Uh, Las Vegas is a 1.19. What's that? Las Vegas is a 1.19. All right, fair enough. I don't own it. I didn't like it when I played it. Great DMC Meepo or Meepo yeah, Service. See, it's, it's cutthroat. There we go. That's uh, yeah. Donna, Donna's already already used to that one. Oh, okay. Oh, Ticket to Ride Amsterdam was... is what she was talking about. Oh, Ticket to Ride Amsterdam. Yeah, okay. Go. That makes sense. That's, that's what happens when we get uh, out of Hold when Doc, we roll Mau, back. Mau. I've, I've heard the name before. Mm. All right. Plus, we have some stuff here from the lobbyist. Uh, from Sorry, from our Discord. So... Nile, I know it, but I can't remember it. Telestrations, we did have. Quirkle, uh, it's it, it's light. It's not ultra light. It close. I don't know that, that if people played Scrabble, it's ultra light. So if you're sitting down with grandma and grandma knows how to score Scrabble, it's ultra light. But if they don't, the scoring in Quirkle's a little weird, especially getting twelve points. Dungeon Mayhem, I have not played. Ku, no, no hidden trader game is ultra light. The the whole fact you have to get that concept that one of the players is playing against everyone else me puts that a a step above ultralight for me uh danielle sagrada way too complex now i will admit when i asked this in the chat room i didn't say ultralight i just said favorite light games i didn't want to totally give away our topic so we're going to get some that are above gobblestones i don't know um why do i know oh yes well i'm like i've gobblestone sounds familiar to me what i don't know that one uh dice forge definitely a little bit above flux i i hate flux that's why it's not on my list. I have had some really bad experiences with Flux. Sushi Go, yes. In Fighting, I have not played. 40 Below. Zombie Dice, it's a little too hard to explain the different symbols and what you're trying to go for. I would say Light. Um, Kin, again, not quite Light. Number nine. No, the scoring's too weird. The look down and count makes it a little bit above. Uh, New York Slice, just the scoring, just by having the anchovies score different from everything else, I think puts it to, to Light, not Ultra Light. Milborn, oh, it's been played so long that I want to say it's ultra light, but to be honest, there's some fiddly rules in there about restarting your car and the flat tires and screwing other players. I'm thinking more light than ultra light, so it's probably rated a one point something. So uh Gobblestones is a is a tile placement. Um it's currently rated a 1.75, but that's only with four votes, so that means nothing. Yeah, that's <laughs> awfully high. That means nothing at all. I would say it is. It is probably a, a one, maybe a one three though. So I think I think it is just yeah, a hair we above, for. Uh, just a hair above our our limit. All right, Jeff Seuss, Fox in the Forest. We already talked about Oni Thomas up there in the same thing. Parade, Dixit. Yeah, all these. I'll to be honest. All of these are in that just that step above. So he's got Fox in the Forest, Oni Thomas, Parade, Dixit, Love Letter, Coo, Welcome to the Dungeon, Jaipur, Red Seven. To me, that's all. A step above. Then he throws in unmatched to be light because the rule book's small and the rules are easy to see. And and the one thing Sean mentioned it and I pointed out, I'm like, any game that has rules for line of sight does not fall into ultra light to me. And and unmatched, the original, the base game is coming in at a 2.0. Yeah, the no way. That that's not even close. Sorry, Jeff. Um Raswell mentions uh more flux, cover your kingdom, which looked neat. Munchkin, no, munchkins 
too many fiddly silly rules and rule arguments and card combo king domino for sure lost cities i was debating this one with d i don't know is lost, lost cities to me the rules for doubling the whole you can you can make the handshake deal i forget what they're called before you go which can double your score and the fact you have to card count one point the, 1.49 yeah see it puts it yeah a bit above what we we're going for uh, if we were doing the 1.5 yes but yeah. And then uh, Sushi Go. And Marvel Flux again is also a 1.5. Yeah, Marvel, well, Borging, he says Millboards does make it. See, I, I was, I, it has been so long since I've actually sat down and played Millborns that yeah. I don't know. I, I know you play these number cards and then someone makes you plays a note of gas on you and then you have to try to restart your car and it's a race to some number. That's what I remember about Millborns. Uh, and then so very wrong about games. We've got all those because we need to look up those. You're not familiar with most of those. So yeah, there's a whole time we already mentioned those. Yeah. Those were already yep. already in the chat. So um Gobblestone's really light. To win takes more. So yeah, that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Playing is just matching colors in the board like Scrabble, where the scoring is based on where you place your tiles. That sounds like it might put it up with the with a bit above with the quirkles, but I'm not positive. Yeah, like that. that's my feeling. Like it's it's light. It's absolutely yeah, light. Yeah, but it light. might be a one point, I'm one point two eight or something. But yeah. It's just above. I think what we're feeling our cutoff is. Just numbered. You can place as many tiles you keep going based on matching. Even that, the you can place, but if you do this, you get the place twice. To me, puts it that that step above. It's that once you start putting in little exception based rules. Yep. I think that puts it to the next level. Like I say, I think that went really well. I love the amount of suggestions we got. Mm -hmm. I love people jumping in into the chat to throw out things there. That was awesome. I hope, Donna, we got a bunch of games for you to check out in the future. Absolutely. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop.